The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Introducing Macquarie ETFs. Macquarie's Active ETFs now give you easier access to the global active investment expertise and strategies that were previously only available as traditional unlisted managed funds. Benefit from the transparency and convenience of an ETF structure underpinned by the global investment expertise of Macquarie's fund managers, which offer you additional options for portfolio diversification and the potential for index outperformance. Discover everyday access to active investments with Macquarie. Visit etf.macquarie.com to find out more. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I've got the pleasure of speaking with Kira Brown today. Kira from FS Recruitment Solutions. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Really pleased to be here. Uh, I just, uh, as we were saying just before we pressed the record, I wanted to, a little while back, I did a, a video, a uh, video, it was, was a video, but a, a podcast uh, with, with someone kind of around recruitment and hiring people in financial advice and so forth. I thought it was a little while since I'd done one of those. And uh, and so hence, here we are. Um, maybe, Kira, can you just spend a minute or two kind of in- introducing yourself? I've We've never spoken before either, so it's good to just know no, what you're around and what no, you're up to. And, um, and well, I've been recruiting purely in the financial planning industry. That was the first job that I fell into when I moved to Australia. Um, mm. About 19 years now in financial planning recruitment. And 14 years of that has been running my own recruitment agency. Uh, it's been me, just a little me by myself for a long time until probably about 12 months ago when I got my full-time assistant, Liz. I call her my assistant, but she manages me and she's absolutely exceptional. Um, and business has never been any better. It's fantastic. Um, yeah. The majority of the firms that I recruit for are private practices. Um, so even back in the bank hey days, I never really did much recruitment for the banks at all. I don't do industry funds. Um, I see a lot of candidates coming out of there, um, but don't tend to recruit in there. So anything from a first financial Acambo, which I've put probably two thirds of the staff of Acambo in the actual office and that kind of size business to your private practices that probably only have, you know, three or four staff members uh, and anything in between. Um, GMs to CSOs. Mm, perfect. And business must be going well for you if you're, you know, 14 years in and, and you've just, you know, in the last year or so hired someone to work with you. Business I must be as good as it's ever been. It, it is. It's great. Yeah. But I, I could have used her probably about 10 years ago. Um, it's just always that reluctance when you're self-employed, you know, oh, really, will it always be this good? Well, you know, take it quite seriously when you hire someone. I convince people to hire people every day of the week. When it comes to me doing it, I really wanted to make sure that, yeah, that I could give someone that security. And now I really do wish I'd have done it a decade ago because she's been a great resource. It's funny you say that. Uh, I, I get the opportunity to talk to a lot of people in financial advice hosting this podcast and a lot of them are just going out on their own or they're beating you know, on their own for the last year or two. And they all talk about that struggle to say, when do I, no, when when can I afford this person? When do I really need them? Yep. And then they all say, I wish I had have done this earlier. Every single yep. person without fail says, I wish I had have done this Absolutely. earlier. Absolutely. Bite off more than you can chew and just chew, chew, chew. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I suppose yep. if you've got to feed yourself and, and enough enough to pay the other person, then, uh, yep. then you'll do what you need to do. That's so maybe right. maybe if we start by giving us kind of a bit of a lay of the land in, in financial advice recruitment. So if we kind of go back a, a while, and you know, I'm, just, I'm not on the recruitment side, you are, but yeah. there's been a whole host of things in financial advice over the years. Like if we go back to the kind of all the banking troubles, they yeah. soaked up all the para planners, then- They're right. We had NAB profession. had a pool of 35 para planners. CBA had a pool of, you know, 30 odd para planners at one time. And so yeah. salaries went through the roof for para planners Absolutely. and that's kind of all died down. Yeah. Not a professional year, and there's been this, uh, this this couple of years period where it was probably difficult, more difficult than it was to get advisors. COVID yeah. seen a bit of an explosion of, of of people seeking advice. So where are we at 
Now. There's been so many epic changes. Well, the Royal Commission, I mean, what that concluded in, was it 2019? Um, basically, the the in, the Royal Commission and the introduction of the professional year has made my life so much more difficult in terms of now the knock-on effect of that is finding a certain demographic of advisors. So those advisors who uh, back uh, back in 2019 were probably para planners, having done three or four years of para planning or associate type work that really should have been stepping up into a junior advisor role, it didn't happen. Because when the professional year came in, businesses didn't know what to do. It wasn't rolled out very well. There wasn't a lot of education around that. And businesses were really frightened to take that commitment on, which meant that it was the uh, the professional year was going around for probably about two years before anybody actually started doing it. And then when they did, that slowed the process down. You've got big, big, big businesses like First Financial and Shadforth and places like that that may say, okay, well, of all the associates, we're only going to put one or two through every year. And what that does is creates a real shortage in the market where we should have a big group of uh, male and female candidates that are probably in their early 30s um, that should probably have three years or so financial planning experience, and they just don't yeah. because that's the demographic that we're missing. So we've got yeah. a lot of people that are just finishing the professional year now with not very much experience, mm -hmm. and then we've got the more mature advisors that got in before that that happened and there's a big shortage in the market when someone comes to me and says, oh, I want an advisor with, you know, three to four years experience. I say, geez, that's a really tough call. That's 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 difficult, that one. But it, that's gonna be that's gonna be with us no, forever. Forever. Because you're gonna have this if someone's coming to you today saying I want someone with three or four years experience and then in a few years time they come into you you're saying, Oh, I'd like someone with ten years experience, for example. Yep. And there's always going to be this chunk of time in the middle there that's missing, isn't it? That's exactly right. It really is. Yeah, it's it's been it's been one of the biggest issues that we've had. Um, and unfairly, a lot of businesses do come to us recruiters with an idea of a certain demographic in mind. Not that they should, um, but but you know they do, and yeah. we can't we can't always find it, and it's yeah. just not available, and it's a real shame. Yeah. What about? Hiring in in other areas, like we you know, we've had periods of time in our business where it's been really difficult to find associate advisors, for example. Yeah. Like you, you you put up a job ad, you get heaps of people applying, but really there's one or two people that might actually be, you know, yeah, good enough that you'd interview them in the first place, let alone offer someone a job. Like, yeah. is is it just for advisors? The quality is tough, or is it everywhere? I will find uh, uh, recruiters, specialised recruiters will always find more quality candidates than a business will. Um, the reason for that is when you're advertising with your own brand, there's always going to be preconceived ideas. Oh, that business is too big. Oh, that business isn't big enough. Oh, I don't want to be one of however many AAs. And whatever those preconceived ideas are will often put some candidates off. Whereas when a recruiter um, advertises something a little bit more generic, or maybe like myself when I'm working on five AA roles on any given day and I have five ads, they'll just come to me to have a chat. And I may be able to get over those preconceived ideas by saying, just because you've had a bad experience in one big firm doesn't mean that they're all the same. This particular firm is a bit different. And I can turn that around and get you more candidates. So we, what you're seeing when you advertise directly may not be exactly what we see in the market. So we tend to see a lot more volume of decent candidates, but still probably only one in every 30 or 40 applications are worthwhile actually interviewing. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose you're, whether, because you've just got the volume of oh, you know, mm -hmm. jobs that you're trying to fill, you're going to be constantly talking to people and yes. the time might not be right for them to make the move today, but next year it is. And, and so there's, I don't know, I would imagine you've got this pool of people that yep. you're in some form of contact with. And that timing uh, that you mentioned is everything because when when we advertise a job, nine times out of 10, the, the candidates that apply don't actually get that job. So I could, you could say, oh, I need a power planner and I'll put an ad for a power planner up as soon as you tell me you need one. Um, but I'll go back to the last three months' worth of power planners I interviewed and I'll call them about the job, organise some interviews. By the time I've actually had applications come in that are half decent for that particular job, probably filled it with someone that I met with a few months ago. So we tend to be working backwards a little bit. But then we've built up our portfolio of candidates that are looking right now and they're red hot, ready to go for when you, when the next power job gets called in. So they often don't get the job they apply for. So it's hard work finding advisors. Is it 
It's hard work Paraplan finding is, associates. Uh, associates is a bit easier. It's para planners. Para planners are the hard work. Business. Yeah. So we've What's seen a, tra- a trend over the last nineteen years since I've been doing this. We've had para planning onshore, and then there's this wave of it's all going offshore, and then. A few years later, everyone's sick of it because the quality is not good enough and they bring it back in and then they say it's too expensive because when they don't have a lot of reviews, they're paying, you know, 90, 100K for a power plan and they're not utilising and then it goes back out and back in and back out. And that's been the trend that I've always seen until probably the last five years or so. It's not coming back in. Um, yeah. m- most of the businesses that I'm dealing with don't actually have power planners and that's why there's so many more AA roles available so the role of an associate advisor back in the day when I was recruiting for them many moons ago was a technical para planner that can attend a client meeting, um, get a feel for the um, client and write the SOA. That's not what an associate advisor does anymore. Now an associate advisor attends a client meeting typically, um, might do some file notes, might do some strategy development and send an SOA request to an external para planner. The para planner actually writes the SOA. So that para planning skill set is now sitting in um, overseas in the Philippines, in Sri Lanka, um, and the, the Melbourne-based ones don't want to be employees because they've got all the flexibility in the world to just pick up SOAs here and there when they want to. They don't have to go to an office. They can work it around their families. So para planning is incredibly difficult. If a business actually comes to me asking for a para planner, it's hard, very hard. Yeah. And so are there are there other oh, I've had some. Um, some some people that that run kind of power planning businesses, onshore power planning businesses. Yeah. But are you finding there's a lot? Are there a lot of solo operators in the power planning space, or are they tied with a with they, an outsource group that might be located in Australia? They there's a lot of good outsource groups um, located in Australia that I've actually referred business to previously. Um, but we do find the odd one or two candidates that that may come to me and apply for a role because they went out on their own when they left their employer in New South Wales and moved to Melbourne and they still do the outsource power planning. But then it's just, it's not enough. Working for one business um, as a power planner is often not enough. And they're trying to tap into these outsource power planning businesses or calling me up and asking me if I know any businesses that that would be able to take them on, even if it's just a day or two a week or the odd one or two SOAs a week. It's very hard to make ends meet if you're just doing power planning by yourself without a group um, to actually, then you become a networker where you're trying to network with financial planning businesses yeah. to ask them for work. It's not typically a power planning skill set. Um, so it's very difficult for them to go out and do that. Yeah. Uh, do you, have you found over the years that many of them have transitioned in, into like a typical associate advisor role now, or are they just a, a different type of person that doesn't doesn't make that fit? Little little bit of both. Um, yeah. the, the more mature, the, pe- the people that got into power planning before the Royal Commission would have been more inclined to do para planning, um, associate advisor, and work their way up. But post rural commission, they're not interested in doing para planning. It's straight to associates, um, or they're para planners that want to be in the back office, um, and they they just want to do the technical work. But what one of the other things that we should mention that's been a drastic drastic impact on our industry um, was all the remediation roles. Mm. Where did all the para planners go? They, I was recruiting. I was recruiting power planning roles, you know, for someone with eighteen months or so experience at seventy five k back in the day, um, in say two thousand nineteen, when that was a really good salary, and then they'd get offered a job doing remediation at ninety five, and of course they just jumped, yeah. um, and and that took away an awful lot of the power planning skill set that we had because they were the majority of people taking these rem- remediation roles or retiring advisors. Um, they didn't want to keep their licenses anymore. Um, and they all came back, you know, uh, back to to trying to get jobs in the industry once all the remediation was over with um, and really struggled because, you know, their skill set wasn't as up to date or as relevant. They would say it is because they looked at SOAs every day of the week and told people what they were doing wrong, um, but they hadn't been doing the modelling on X plan and actually writing the SOAs for some time. So that was that was a real challenge too. I was going to ask if that have, did 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 those people come back into a first financial type business as a power plan, or did we do, do, do we lose them completely? From I think we we lost them. We lost the majority of them yeah. um, because there there aren't so many power planning roles available anymore. So they had to go and do different things. 
Um, and also their expectations in terms of salary was through the roof. I was going to say, we, I mean, we, we lost, like we, I can remember back when that was all going on, we lost some people in our power planning team. Uh, and and there was there was, there was there was one girl that got from our client servants team. She'd gone into power planning, and then she was there for a while, and then she got a contract job with one of them doing remediation. Mm-hmm. And like her, her salary was all was higher than what we we're paying some of the advisors at that stage. Like, well, she's in her early twenties. Like she'd be silly not to go and do that and take yeah. money whilst it's on offer. But if then you, you know, once... put that money away and realize yeah. that you're going to be taking like a thirty percent pay cut when that when that period back. is over. That's mm-hmm. great. <laughs> But we all know that most of us just live within our means, right? <laughs> and then you've got to suffer a huge pay cut when you've got a mortgage. Yeah, that, and I think that would have been the sticking point for a lot of people to say, you mean I have to go, to go back and do the job that I was doing, I have to yeah, take a 30% pay cut. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, was, it was a very hard reality, unfortunately. And so what about the client services type role? What's, what's life like in that, in that space? Oh, there is such a desire for career CSOs. It's unbelievable. So if I find a fabulous career CSO that says to me, I don't want to be a power planner, I don't want to be an associate, I'm just perfectly happy being the backbone to this particular advisor or supporting a number of advisors, uh, even if I don't have a job available, I can send an email to my top 10 clients and say, hey, I've got a great career CSO, anybody interested? And I'll get them a few interviews and someone will snap them up. Um, because they're so hard to come by. Everybody wants to be wants to be applying for this job because they want the next one. But if you actually find someone that just genuinely enjoys that job and, and they're very, very good at it, uh, there's always a home for them. And the unfair thing is that, yes, you should get paid more if you've been doing the job longer and you're, you're more qualified. But even if you have the same experience as someone, like you've got two, three years experience as a CSO and you want to stay in that role, Versus you've got two or three years experience as a CSO, but you want to be an associate, the career CSO will get paid more yeah. because businesses are prepared to pay for that consistency and for the lack of pressure to have to promote in order to retain. Um, so they'll pay a premium. What are, what are businesses paying as a, as a ballpark for that type Anything, of business? Any, it's hard. It's anybody with 12 months experience as a CSO, degree qualified, 12 months in a decent business could be looking at anything from a bare minimum of 65 plus super. Um, and then your career CSOs are absolutely fabulous. I don't want to get anybody too excited when I say this, but uh-huh. last year I did place a number of them on 90 plus super and one on 95 plus super. And yeah. um, that it's hard to get. That's not a reality for the vast majority. But I would say that about 80K plus super for three years plus CSO experience, if you want to stay in a CSO role, is is very achievable. Yeah. And you've got to look at it from that. Like you look at, you, you hear numbers like that, you're like, that's a lot of money, you know. But then when you, when you think about it from a business perspective, particularly if you don't have a big pool of client services where you can somewhat deal with people coming and going. Yes. But but if you're a smaller business where you have one or two people there, mm-hmm. that's a big downtime if one of your client service people leaves because they get yep. promoted or they go somewhere else. And then you've got this gap of, I can't, I need to hire someone, I need to mm-hmm. train someone, it's going to take them a while to get up and running. Like you're going to burn thousands of dollars in time yes. and, and effort. Yep. Versus, you could have just paid someone what sounds like a big salary yep. for, for a particular role, but you paid someone, and then they're hopefully there for the long term. The best thing that a business can do is focus on retention, and I know that's yes. terrible for my career, um, but <laughs> but giving that advice to businesses that know me really well and trust me, and um, they will often come to me. I mean, Joe Akiki, he's a good one. He'll come to me every now and then, and he'll be like, Kira. Um, what do I need to be paying so and so? You know, I've got to do a pay review. And what do you think about this? And what, you know, good businesses actually care about paying the right amount for their staff. And will actually come to you and say, "What should I be paying?" And I'll tell them, "Oh, you're a little bit unders on this one, or I'd be a bit concerned about you losing this one." And you'll go, "Right, great, okay, I'm going to up their salary. That's what I'm going to do." And you know, be smart. You can you could pay your CSOs an extra five thousand dollars a year. And it will save you a $15,000 recruitment fee and an extra $10,000 that you're going to have to pay the next one. Um, be smart about it. Um, yeah. re- retain them and pay them what they're worth in the market. And often businesses will say to me, oh, you know, my CSO left, but I, they were just asking for so much money. I just didn't think they were worth it. I say, well, I was, use this, it may, may be silly. I'll say, well, they're worth what the market's prepared to pay. 
It's like you saying that your house is worth a million dollars. Well, when you go to auction, if someone pays 1.1, that's what it was worth. If someone pays 900 and that's the top bid up, then that's, that's what the house was worth. And it's the exact same for candidates. They're worth what the market is prepared to pay. And if they can go out and get a job tomorrow paying an extra $10,000, then that's what their value in the market is. I was going to ask you how do you how do you retain the good people like you, you know, clearly you pay them appropriately and so forth, but but do you see businesses doing any more than just paying them what they're worth? Flexibility, like flexibility. Good, yeah, everybody wants flexibility. It's yep. the number one thing. So I did about um, how many interviews? I did three uh, interviews today, and all three candidates said I would move for the same money if I was able to work from home two days a week. Yeah, I'd love to get a pay increase, but it's not as important to me as the opportunity to work from home two days a week. To skip the 45 minutes to hours commute, and one of the candidates I interviewed today, um, she lives in South Melbourne. I said, God, you're not commuting very far, you know, you're going to the far. CBD. Well, I've got a dog and I wouldn't yeah. mind not having him locked up in the apartment all day. And yeah. for my lunch break, I'd like to go for a walk around the park with my dog instead of a walk around the city. Is that too much to ask for? Some employers would be, would think that that is ridiculous and some employers will embrace that and say, as long as the job gets done, who cares? doesn't matter where you're doing it from. You get a sense of what businesses are doing in terms of that working from home, working from the office, halfway in between. Like, Do you, do you have an idea where that's heading or yeah. what's going on out there? And I, I don't think it's as clear as everyone's trying to get people back into the office, but I do see a lot of that. There's a lot yeah. of businesses that are trying to get people back in the office four or five days a week. Yeah. Um, but then there's a lot of businesses that just know that they will lose staff if they change things. So they're keeping it at two days a week from home. There's a beautiful business in the CBD that I was recruiting for 12 months ago, and they were looking for an associate. I kept coming up with these great candidates, but everybody wanted to work from home two days a week. And it was a year ago and people are a little bit more inclined to come in now. And um, in the end, I said to this, um, and I've recruited everyone in this business. There's 10 staff in there and I've got a great relationship with the manager. And I said, Rob, if you change this to two days a week, this job will be easy to fill. But I've been working on it for four weeks now and it's the definition of insanity because every time I get you a good candidate, they get three other interviews for three other jobs. They love yours, but the other businesses are offering them two days a week from home. So he said, leave it with me. I'll get back to you. He called me back an hour later and he said, Kira, we now close the office on a Tuesday and a Thursday. They're the days that everybody works from home <laughs> and we only do client meetings, you know, on the other three days. I was like, great. If I hadn't have filled that job within a couple of days, I would have looked like a fool. So luckily I did and it was so much easier. So some businesses are embracing it and they're listening to their staff. Um, and some businesses are really putting the pressure on for people to come back in. Yeah, see, I I, I get that sense. You know, I talk to different people that, that, like, as you said, people are leaving because of because they want the flexibility. I said someone on the podcast that lives a long way from Melbourne, and he said, "I'm sick of going backwards and forwards," and he's working for a for a financial advice business that's in Queensland, and so it's 100 percent from home. And I think yeah, employers that yeah. whichever way the businesses decide to go, are we all from the office, are we part from home? Yep. You're going to need to appreciate that you may lose some people if you're pushing all the way yeah. to the office because there are other options out there. Yep. A um, regional Queensland business uh, called me last week and said, look, we need a CSO. We've tried really hard. We can't find anybody in the area. Um, we're now starting to think, well, if we've had CSOs in the Philippines, why can't we have a CSO in Melbourne? Um, yeah. That may be someone with a lot more experience. Um, so, so they engaged me to find someone for them 100% remotely. Um, and then some businesses just never let their, even during COVID, they made excuses to have their staff in five days a week yeah. and they've never faltered from that. And that's yeah. it. Five days a week. They wouldn't yeah. even comprehend someone working from home a day a week. Yeah. I suppose just, just different ways of running businesses mm. and, and you'll make your own decision on how you want to run it. And, and if it works, then, then you'll staff it accordingly, I guess. Yeah. If it works for them, great, but they will find it harder to find staff. Yeah. So what about the other side of things? Yeah, we're, we're talking about in, in employers trying to find staff in different roles and, and, and so forth. What about the other side of it that I've got a job, I'm working in a business. How, how do I how do I make myself attractive to other employers if I'm not getting the opportunities where I currently am? Mm -hmm. How can I make myself attractive to someone that might be hiring for that next job that I'm looking for? Can I tell you the most basic of thing, mistakes that we see? 
mm. spelling errors on your resume, <laughs> forgetting to put capitals at the beginning of your sentences, and misspelling um, my role, R-O-L-L, -L, was to, you know, th th things like that are pretty, you know, we see that a lot, and you are not making yourself very attractive to to other employers if, you, if you've if you got spelling and grammatical issues on your resume. So that's often a problem that we're seeing firstly. Yeah, and yeah. But it's not as hard on the candidate side as it is on the employer side. It's a candidate-driven market at the moment. Um, there's there's candidates out there that, that could easily, I, mean, I could get one decent candidate, three or four good job offers um, in one week. Um, it's not that difficult for them, you know, don't forget to dress appropriately for an interview. We've all become very, very relaxed post-COVID with being able to work from home and doing a lot of Zoom meetings and Teams and that sometimes can do, uh, if I'm not smart enough to think I need to make sure this person knows to wear a suit to the interview because sometimes I won't tell them because I assume a certain level of intelligence yeah. um, and then candidates will turn up just looking really casual for an interview and it, it may be a particularly senior role yeah. And they've just lost all credibility straight away. So, you know, don't forget, yes, we are post-COVID and the world is a little bit more relaxed, but, you know, first impressions count. Don't apply for every single job that a recruiter is advertising. I may have 15 to 20 jobs on seek on any given day. And if you apply for every single one of them, um, it just makes it look a little bit silly and I don't know what you actually want. So that can be quite confusing as well. Um, but it's certainly not as hard for candidates to get jobs as it is for the employers to find the right people. Because that, that, like that applying for multiple jobs example there. Oh, they'll apply for a CSO, a power planner and a senior advisor role. Yeah. If I, if I, I'm just going to apply for one job with you and then hopefully get a chance to speak with you and then you'll help me work out which of the 15 jobs that you're trying to fill yeah. I might be yeah. best put forward for. Yeah. And, and a lot of people do do that. Um, and that's the benefit of having so many different jobs available that I do get lovely phone calls from candidates that say, Kira, I just wanted to call you because I've seen that you've got so many different roles available. This is my experience. You know, do you think you could help me? And I say, great, let's have a Teams chat. Let's figure out what suits you the best. And then, you know, could, could be that we represent you for three different roles, but it may be that none of them are right for you at the moment and we'll keep you in mind for the next one. Um, but that scattergun approach of applying for every single job um, yeah, so it wouldn't be the best way to do things. I suppose there's people, you know, the, some of the younger ones that have just come out of uni and they're doing, you know, client service type roles and whatever. They they will have never even thought about this this kind of stuff that we're that we're talking about after you've been in it for a while and you might have moved a few jobs. You get a sense of what what you need to do and what you don't need to do. But yeah, but when, so you're, new, when yeah. you're new and you don't know any different, unless your parents maybe tell you what what you should do and how you should. What about the career advisors at university? Do mm. they do they not help them? Do they not point them in the right direction? So I I had and I I can't remember her name, but when I so my first job out of uni, I had a I had a job working at Mercer, and then I was trying to get other jobs, and it wasn't until I sat down with a recruiter and and she said to me. Well, what studying have you done since you finished university? Like you've got a commerce degree, and I, I, no one had ever said to me I needed to do any other study than do my commerce degree at uni. I had no yeah. idea that this whole other world of studying existed. It wasn't until the recruiter <laughs> told me, Eventually. like, oh, right, okay, I need to go and do something else. Where I did some studying and then ended yeah. up with other jobs. But a lot of the time, our jobs as recruiters are to give people ideas and coach them. We, you know, I feel. Um, uh, I feel about 65 roles every financial year. Now, yeah. I would interview at least 10 candidates every week, sometimes 15. Sometimes I'll have a slow week because I'm busy with, with other things. And um, so we don't we don't place all the candidates that we meet. Um, and sometimes they're just, their applications aren't great. And we just spend the time talking to them saying, look, I can't get you your first job in financial planning um, because businesses don't often like to pay recruiters for someone with no experience. So we get a lot of graduates approaching us and we're kind to them and we always give them the time of day and say, look, um, we can't help you with your first job, but here's some pointers on your resume. You know, put some um, hobbies on there, put some social. You talked to me about the fact that you were captain of a football team. Put that on there. People like that you're, you know, you're sociable and you're sporty and you're 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 into leadership and you know. So put these things on your resume. Don't forget to put these dates that you worked in this supermarket and do this and do that. 
um, apply to businesses directly. You know, oh, you live in Blackburn. Do you know how many financial planning businesses are, are within 5Ks of Blackburn? Go Google, go and send your resume to them directly, you know, and you'd be amazed at how many people come back years later saying, Kira, you gave me this great advice a few years ago and now I'm a, an associate advisor and I want you to help me get the next job. And um, so we do spend a lot of time guiding people, um, but there's only so much that we can do for really junior candidates, unfortunately. Yep. I've had a couple of chats with people in different businesses, you know, well-established businesses, they're, they're kind of owners and managers running businesses, try to find senior advisor, uh, senior advisors to come in. And, and they all talk about, we struggle to find the right fit person. Do you get a sense of if it's like if that's a different so so they're, they're businesses where there's there's existing clients there's new client inquiries coming through yep. like they're not looking for someone to bring a whole lot of clients with them they're saying yep. we need someone to fill the spot and we're yep. going to support you with all of these you know associate advisors or whatever it might be but they can't but find finding the, right... the person to find that that spot yeah seems yeah difficult. uh some businesses are some busy businesses are extremely fussy and I'm not saying that that's wrong at all because I think that we want to we want to get it right us recruiters yeah. don't want to be working for 50 percent of our fee we don't want to fill the job and then have to refill it a few months later because we got it wrong we want it we want to do it properly and it so we appreciate if a business doesn't take someone that they're only 50 percent sure of or even 90 percent sure of because we don't want to do the work again we want to get it right but yes yeah, sometimes the criteria, that we get is ridiculous um, and we get a lot of, oh, you know, he's too similar to this other person that we've got and the problem that we've got with this other person is this um, four or five rounds of interviews. There's a particular business that I'm thinking of that puts people through five rounds of interviews and in total when my candidate went through the process with them, uh, she'd probably spent maybe 10 to 12 hours with this business before getting the job offer. Now, imagine if she hadn't got that job offer all the time that was invested in that just to not get it. And and obviously that does happen to a lot of people that apply for that job. Um, businesses are very, very fussy. But yes, it is a struggle to find a certain type of advisor. And I think that Australia, um, we can potentially be a little bit narrow-minded. Um, we, we tend to like a certain style. We tend to want people that mirror us. Mm. Um, and we don't want someone too different, and that can be a bit of a problem as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want we want all the advisors, and the associates, and everyone to kind of look and act the same, don't we? Rather than That's exactly right. Yeah. That is exactly yeah. right. Um, yeah. There's there's not as much diversity as there should be in the industry. Has there has it ever not been a uh, you put your credit to the candidate market before? Has it ever not been a candidate market, or is it just it's either more or less of can candidate um, market? No. Remember a time when it was an employer market? Now, yep. show my age. She didn't. <laughs> but no, I do remember the time, yeah, where we were saying sorry to candidates, you know, no, nah, sorry. Um, right, the jobs. Yeah, yeah. And they were they were calling us pretty desperate. Have you got any contract jobs? Have you got any temp jobs? Um, there just wasn't enough jobs around. But that was a very long time ago. But yeah, for, for an extremely long time, it has been a candidate-driven market. The candidates are dictating terms. Because if you can find a good one, you'll bend over backwards to to accommodate them. And I'm not sure if it's right or wrong, but it's what tends to happen. Yeah, I suppose it's just a just a, a sign of where we're at. You know, there's been thousands of advisors that have left the industry, so there's probably knock on effects for support staff and everyone else. Absolutely, but there's aging population, people transitioning to retirement, so you've got increasing demand, decreasing supply, supply. and you, you kind of That's got the economics crossover and. I'll, I'll, I'll often say, I'll often say to a business, I'm representing this candidate, whatever they're, they're they're 100 100k plus super, whatever the job is, whatever the candidate, uh, they're asking for 100k plus super. Please note, that's what they're asking for today. Now, if this person goes out and does three other interviews as well as yours, and they're offered 110 plus super at three other businesses, do not be surprised if I come back to you and ask for an extra ten thousand yeah. dollars. So I'm saying to you that today they're asking for a hundred. But I don't like it when at the last minute candidates ask me for more because I'll say, I represented you at 100, you told me you would take 100, you told me you were happy with 100, and now I'm embarrassed going back to my businesses and asking for more money. And everything's blame the recruiter. The recruiter wants to make more money. So I will often now say this candidate's going to be very popular. He or she has three other interviews. If they offer her more money, you're going to need to be prepared to pay more. 
and or we walk away. That's fine. But I'm just raising it with you that it may happen. Yep. 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 That's, it. That's a candidate market. <laughs> Kira, thanks for joining me this afternoon. For anyone that wants to reach out to you and find you, where can they, where's best to, where's best to find you? Uh, kbrown at fsrecruit.com.au. Thanks for joining me. Awesome. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, James. Have a great day.